Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending when you're watching this, students. We are going to be diving into the fifth module topic of deviance. Now, before we get started, I wanted to start by saying that this is actually one of my favorite topics, uh, so much so that if you do find this topic interesting, I actually do teach a class on this here at Arizona State University called Social 340, the social, social deviance. It used to be referred to as the sociology of deviance, but now it's just social deviance. But essentially, we are going to be covering in this first part, the idea of social control and how that's connected to deviance, and just general generalities of deviance as we cover it from the sociological perspective. Said differently, we're also going to be covering what is deviance, how do we understand it, and how it's used for social control. Part two, which will be after this one in the different video that you'll pull up, we'll be covering the sociological theories, both from all the paradigms, symbolic interactionalism, functionalism, conflict theory, and how those tie to and are understood within deviance and the theorists that have helped to spur the conversation around. So without further ado, I am going to be pulling up the slide deck and I will be going over the various topics covered here on what is deviance and how to understand deviance as a perspective, essentially giving you a background as towards the importance and the power of deviance in itself. So give me a moment here, I'll pull up my slides and we will do our usual spiel, all right? Give me one second here. All right, perfect. Sorry for that delay. All right, so welcome, welcome, welcome to the Sociology of Deviance. I usually be teaching this as a full class, but we are also in the intro, so we're gonna be covering the construct of what is deviance and how do we as a individuals understand deviance and how it can be understood from a topical understanding of students who are just now touching the period. So for those of you who are not familiar with deviance, you probably are familiar with the name. It's probably something that you may not have a positive connotation with, meaning you probably don't think about someone calling you a deviant as a good thing. Now, this is not unheard of, and it's actually very socially constructed to be as such, right? Deviance isn't a simple dichotomy. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's not this. It's not that. It's essentially a social construction, as we've talked about in this class, there are many different dynamic social constructions within our everyday life. And deviance is no different than anything else we've covered in the sense that it is a socially constructed idea that has had much sociological and social connection to it, and also has been utilized as a system of control. And that is one of the things we're going to be covering today is the control elements that deviance provides. So what is a deviant? Well, a deviant isn't someone good or bad. It's not someone evil or maleficent. It's not someone angelic or happy, right? It's not right. It's not wrong. It's a social construction used to give our understanding. And to kind of illustrate this further, allow me to get to the next slide here. All right. So you've got this really big list, right? Look at all these people here. Giordano Bruno, Martin Luther King Jr., Kamala Harris, Adolf Hitler, Galileo, George Washington, Barack Obama, Jesus Christ, Abraham Lincoln, Donald Trump, Mahatma Gandhi, Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, right? This is a large group of people. So I ask you, pause this if you'd like to actually do this social experiment. I do this in class and I've done it before. Uh, I actually wrote my capstone three from my master's program on this, but what do these people have in common? What does Abraham Lincoln and Adolf Hitler have in common? What does Jesus Christ and Donald Trump have in common? Simply put, I just showed you a list of deviants. Let that sink in. Barack Obama, Jesus Christ, Abraham Lincoln, Donald Trump, Mahatma Gandhi, Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, these are all deviants, deviants, right? We have people like George Washington who <clears throat> helped establish the United States. We have Barack Obama, the first African-American president here within the United States, right? We have Jesus Christ, the religious icon of Christianity, Mahatma Gandhi, someone who was definitely on the idea of protesting in different ways, right? As towards hunger strikes, et cetera. Malcolm X, Rosa Parks. How can these people be a list of deviants? Well, <clears throat> as I said to you, Deviance isn't a simple dichotomy. So let's go into what deviance means. Said in a very simplistic sense, deviance by definition is a deviance just means a violation of norms. That's it, beep, stop, right there. You covered deviance. Deviance just means to break norms. Anything that falls outside of what is normal within a group, that's a deviant. Marvel uses the word deviance to describe the villains. These are constructed ideological concepts to connect to you to have a certain 
opinion of the word, right? Deviance is socially constructed. It's relative to time, place, and context. Another way to say that is sin, sickness, and selected, which you've probably heard me say in this class before. We use the sin to enforce religious fervor. People say this is wrong because God says so. We use the idea of sickness, mental health, right? We have this idea of, the, oh, these people must have been unwell. That's why they did this thing, this negative thing that we see as negative right now. And when you connect it to the idea of selected, it's the idea of what we do or do not perceive at this current time, place, and context as right or wrong. A uh, great example of this right now would be that it would be deviant for a doctor as of right now to perform an abortion. <clears throat> if I had said this like six months ago, you would have been like, what? No, it's not. It is now a change of time. And it is a scary time because a lot of things are being attacked on this. A lot of things are being built up on this, and we'll talk about this further. I don't like bringing politics into my classroom, but deviance is a great example of this. It's what we, in historical context, view as sin, sickness, and selected. It's a go going against the norms, the norms of the culture and the society that we're within. And like it says on the slide, this can be negative, this can be positive. It's really a matter of perspective and also a matter of social connection to the time, place, and context. Slavery in the United States was not deviant until it became illegal. Now it is something we look back on as a tarnished part of our history and rightly so, right? It was bad. But the connection to the idea is that during a certain time in place, it wasn't a negative, but now it is a negative. It was viewed as a positive. Uh, I have a slide on here, I may or may not pull up, that Abraham Lincoln famously said that if he could have ended the war without ending slavery, he would have. Because what you have to understand is that time changes, socialization changes, and as these times change, what is wrong and what is right is not as simple, it's not as simplistic as being yes or no. That's why it's not a simple dichotomy. So let's look at the deviant impact level. Well, as anything with sociology, this ties to micro and macro. Even the small scale things can make an impact all the way to macro, large ticket actions, leaving a mark. Essentially what we're looking at here, right, is that there are types of deviant action. Micro, this is gonna be actions, reactions, and deviations, breaking social norms, making people uncomfortable. Another term for this, if you wanna pull back to our further lectures is folk ways. And these are the ideas from informal norms, right? These are very common with the actions that we do. If we show up to a party without a tie on, that is a black tie event, we may receive social isolation, osculations and shifts towards how we're acting, right? Uh, macro, these leave a mark, wars, laws, riots, anomaly, social change. Think about the mark right now that Roe v. Wade being overturned within the Scoutists is actually impacting our day-to-day -day lives, right? Wars, think about the impact that has caused negative connection to Russia and people who are from Eastern European or South Russian impact with the idea of Putin's war on Ukraine, right? Think about the laws and the riots. Think about how many ways that we've seen the different impacts of social uproars about certain dynamics and tickets of political or socio-relevant conversations, right? And we've covered this in class as an impact because of deviance. When we don't follow the rules of order, meaning the norms, we fall into a place of unknowing, which Emile Durkheim refers to as anomic circumstances. And this can lead to anomic suicide. It can lead to anomic change, anomic impact. And one of the biggest things to mention here is that where deviance crosses the line by having this dynamicism of actually impacting and adjusting from the norm shifts can also create a large impact for social change. Because as we see things as being wrong, we then go to a place where we start seeing why are they wrong? And if they're not that wrong, maybe we make a change that can create a norm adjustment so that action is no longer deviant, or maybe the action becomes deviant because of it. This is how it kind of plays out. So let's talk about that. I mentioned the word norms, right? I mentioned this idea. So norms are essentially broken down in different perspectives. You have folk ways. These are everyday norms. These are things that we violate on a day-to-day -day basis, or we do not violate on a day-to-day -day basis, and the complications can be on the micro side. Mores, serious threats, Mores are moral. Think about the word moral <clears throat> and how that connects to the idea of mores. So it's an easy way to understand that. Serious, threatened, social order when broken. These usually refer to in the size of laws. Taboos, these are super mores. These are things such as incest, murder, et cetera. Things that universe, they're cultural universals as we talked about earlier in the course. This idea of a cultural universal ties to the construction that most people would know these are wrong. Taboos tend to be very well understood as being a no-no for all cultures. And then mores tie into what I mentioned laws. These can become either folkways or mores can tie into being considered laws, but they're formalized norms. So we no longer can just violate these and receive un- written documentation such as being isolated or such as knowing that we broke something laws make them written down so now they're in practice 
And this is where we start getting to the position of the term social control, usage of these norms to instigate control or elements of understanding when it comes to a social construction of reality. So regulation and enforcement of norms to create social order. In essence, without law, rule and order, a lot of people think there would be chaos. And this is why social control is used to impact this dynamicism, right? So to enforce social rules, society employs sanctions. They use these sanctions both on negative and positive measures to be able to give you a reward for following suit or give you a punishment if you do not listen. And these can vary in the severity of them, right? Positive, here's a reward. If you work hard at work, you get a promotion. If you do the right thing, your parents may give you a cookie. Uh, participation trophy joke, right? The millennial catapult, right? We all participated so we get a trophy and that's Anyway, negative, this can be a driving citation. If you do not follow the speed limit, you'll get a ticket that will cost you money. That money must be used as a memory for you to follow the speed limit or don't go through the yellow light, don't go through the red light. Arrested, if you do something and have an expectation that you weren't supposed to do it and it was a more, you can be arrested and then your time will be punished in the sense that you'll go to jail, a total institution, right? Or expulsion from college, right? You can take this as an example. If you're somebody who has cheated on a test and get caught, the action will be negative and you will be expelled from college. It'll go on your permanent record and then you will have to pay for the so-called crimes or norm violation. So you can probably think of a hundred situations and if we were in class, I'd ask questions on this like in person, but maybe write about this on Yellow Dig. Think about the way social control has been utilized within your childhood or in your earlier um, years of maturation, right? How many ways did your parents can be positive rewards or negative rewards? And how is that used to create a sense of order within your home? So sanctions, as I mentioned again, Time back to it, we just covered it, but they're negative and positive, use for social control. Informal sanctions is a term you should know, it's why I'm covering here. It's enforcement through informal interactions and reactions, meaning that there isn't a written law on this. It's informed through informal dynamics. Don't show up to a party of a black tie event in jeans and a t-shirt or you will be ostracized, right? Formal sanctions, these are now written down. Think about masks, when there was a mask mandate, they had to put it on the wall so people would follow it or people going in to a store and them saying, well, you don't have a sign saying that I can't have no shirt, no shoes, no service, right? So when formal sanctions are written down, it is enforced officially and recognized when written. So so the whole idea, if you ever were in the marketing world, there's an old thing saying a verbal contract is great, but a written contract is legal. And that's the reality behind it. Because if I tell you I'm going to do something cool, I might do it. But if I write it down, now I have to follow through. That's a formal sanction. <coughs> so again, tying to this, informal, formal, right from, right from your books. Can you think of any examples of these? Positive, an expression of thanks would be informal, formal, promotion at work, negative, an angry comment online, right? Write down, uh, formal, a parking fine, right? So there's variations of this platform. Usually I go to class and see if anyone can think of these. I think this would be a great topic for Yellow Dig. Think about ways that you've had both formal and informal sanctions or positive or negative evaluations and feedbacks. So think about some examples you've had. Where did you see your parents using rearing tactics? Where did you get corrected at work? If you've worked a job, how many ways have you seen positive or negative enforcement be able to impact how you work, right? Let's get to the next part here, which is social control. To whom much is given, much is tested, get arrested, guess what? Until he gets the message, I feel the pressure under more scrutiny. And what do I do? Well, I act more stupidly. This is Kanye West, I'm a huge fan of Kanye West. And the reality is that that song does a great job if you further listen to it and talking about the ways that no matter how far we go, we can still be impacted by how we act. And even though we're under circumstances, we tend to have scrutiny, right? So what happens when we act out? Well, we get repressed, we get pushed back, we get put into formal or informal sanctions. I've got friends, I've definitely got friends, you know, that whole idea. Well, the reality of is that we never know where we are until we break that norms. How many of you have been in a situation where you violate social contracts of in engagement and conversation? How many situations as you then pull to a circumstance where you find that you don't have as many friends as you thought you had, right? Because when you violate social norms that we all know, it can create the taboo movement where you are now considered problematic. Think about the social dynamicism of canceling nowadays. We use the internet to cancel somebody who has broken norms that we all agree are a part of our day-to-day -day interaction. So that's a good one to also talk about, the elements of social control. But it is through these various types of interactions and sanctions, positive and informal, that we are able to maintain stability within our society. Without it, we wouldn't be able to know what's right, what's wrong. We would go into a sense of anomic understanding. Because if we do not know what's expected of us, then what ends up happening is that the expectations are not preset. And we go in having to rewrite and code everything in our head, which becomes exhaustive. So we become socially repressed when we violate, but we also are socially rewarded when we do not violate. So usually I play this video, essentially it's the strike to jail, right to jail, you see them, right to jail, video from Parks and Recs. But reality is, is that that's how we've used social control.
We have to use social control in a dynamic aspect to be able to enforce behaviors and what the punishment you should be expected to have, right? A lot of people don't commit crimes, not because they don't want to do the action, because what happens when you violate that norm is that you are arrested. If you're arrested, your time is your most valuable currency and it's taken from you, right? So violation of law, that would be seen as a crime. It's good to know this term for your quiz. Violation of law that is punishable by formal sanction. Many crimes are also thought of deviant by most people in society, right? There's different variations of what is and what isn't criminal. Yet, can you think of some crimes that aren't considered deviant? For example, if you were out protesting against this Roe versus Wade circumstance, it's a good example that many people who are pro-choice, right, would not see you as a deviant. They'd see you as fighting for your rights. This is the idea of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. They were they were arrested. George Washington, when he started the column, when he came over here, the English used him as a hybrid deviant, right? So you have deviants but not criminal, or you have crimes that are not deviant but are not goes back and forth, back and forth. What about deviant behaviors that are not crimes, right? So that's what I was just tying to, anything informally sanctions. There's variations of how to understand this. Deviance doesn't always line up with criminality. It's just so circumstantial that many of us think of deviance as crime. So violent crime, an example of this, if you can think of great topics to talk about this within Yellow Dig, many crimes are also thought of as deviant by most people in society. This would fall into the idea of violent crimes. These types of crimes tend to be what we see in the nightly news or it comes from mind shootings, beatings, physical actions that result in criminal charges and sanctions. Nonviolent crimes, what about deviant behaviors that are not crimes, anything informally sanctioned? Can you think of some nonviolent crimes? Can you, maybe like loitering, right? Like, is that really a criminal behavior or is it deviant? Like, this would be a great topic to bring up. Let's talk about some nonviolent crimes. Another sense of this can be types of criminality, right? Victimless crime. Now, this is a really powerful one because this is most commonly associated with things such as the idea of white collar crime. What is an example of this? Well, think about the idea of we crashed. Think about the idea of Enron. Think about the idea of companies and pyramid schemes where the people don't know that they're being impacted, but the lowest people on the totem pole are the ones who end up being impacted by this, right? You have a circumstance where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and we always make fun of MLMs, but the people who invest everything they have end up losing everything. But you know, many people make money on it. So it gets viewed as a nonviolent, it's a victimless crime. No one did this to you, you did it to yourself. Well, you joined because you were promised a sense of reality. The American dream can sometimes see it as a victimless crime, right? If you don't have the connections, you fall into what Merton talks about in strength theory, which we'll cover in a few slides. To keep with the flow of this, to make sure I give you a good understanding of this and not run too long, I'm not gonna go over all of this, but these are the variations of theories that are associated with the types of look of deviance that you can go into. I cover this deeply in my class if you're interested, but Merton covered strain theory or how we react when we do not get our accepted goals by accepted methods. Uh, social disorganization theory, which was started by the University of Chicago researchers. Weak social ties leads to more deviance and the ability to enforce norms within some groups. If you do not have connection to it, you tend to deviate. Cultural deviance theory, conformity to the cultural norms of lower class society. If you're raised within an area that has lack of resources, you tend to have a different view on what is criminal and what isn't. If surviving requires you stealing, you would and see stealing as a crime, right? The culture around you embeds this. You see a lot of this in a lot of depictions in movies and media of people who grew up in very crime-rated neighborhoods or lower socioeconomic status, status neighborhoods, right? If someone grew up in a very poor neighborhood, they'd have different norms of what is and what isn't deviance than those who grew up in a higher economic tier. Conflict theory looks at the idea of deviance arises from Right? So functionalism is looking how it functions within society, so strain, disorganization, and deviance, and why does it exist? Conflict theory, as it always does, is looking at it from a macro perspective, and how does deviance arise? So Marx talks about the construct of unequal systems. Inequalities in wealth and power arise from the economic system, creating deviances and striking against the powers that creates this type of inequalities. Power elite, or by C. Wright Mills, ability of those in power to define deviance in ways that status quo. Essentially, if you write the law, how do you get busted for it, right? The power elite control the rules and thus are are able to impact those rules around them. Uh, symbolic interactionalism, again, think completely micro, it's about our day-to-day -day experiences. A deviance rises from labeling theory. Lemert and Becker and Becker talk about this, that the labels that we are given or possess impact how we see the world. And by those labels, <coughs> Merton, who we just talked about strain theory, ties the idea of the self fulfilling prophecy, but labels have such a powerful impact on our master status and who we think we are that we tend to follow them because we've been sanctioned and socially controlled to believe that this is our way of life. Um, Sutherland talks about differential association theory. If you're a criminology major, you'll read tons of Sutherland, but essentially learning and modeling deviant behavior from the areas around us. Uh, people who go to prison often say they became better criminals after they went to prison, right? Because they're surrounded with people who have done it more. You learn to do it better every single time you're in a situation that you are able to learn from people who are more talented. Uh, control theory by Hershey is very fascinating. Our level of deviance is very structured by the amount of control we have in our social environments. 
So if we're in a situation where we have a lot of connection to our neighbors, our families, our networks, our church, et cetera, we're less likely to deviate because it comes at too high of a cost. So these are some of the views. I'll cover more of them on our next lecture when we talk about the theories. But can you have fun with it? Yeah, you can. Uh, deviance is actually a really fun topic because you can challenge the norms. Uh, one fun one for you to actually, and I will drop out of sharing screen to talk about this. One fun thing that you can do is violate social contracts, right? Uh, I challenge you to, and maybe write about this in Yellow Dig if you do it. I challenge you to actually go out and someone says to you, which is a very Americana engagement, how are you? actually answer them tell them if you're having a bad day and try to see how long you can keep that going because how they asked you how you are they've signed a social contract a control element that they are waiting for your response so if someone says how are you say well actually i've had a pretty rotten horrible terrible day and this is the things that happen they'll stand there and wait for you to finish because they've asked you how you are uh, there's tons of ways to play with this the responses can be fabulous acts of extreme happiness can be seen as deviant uh, if you go out and do two, uh, radical acts of kindness people may be flabbergasted to have someone pay for their coffee, thus can have reactive actions of people going out and trying to buy more coffee because they don't want to owe anybody. There's tons of ways to mess with people. But this will bring us to the end of this lecture, right? Uh, some more examples for you. Ask someone to tie your shoe that messes with people. Uh, overreact to all the things around you, like really overreact, like, wow, it's raining. Uh, go into an elevator and stand the opposite way. Just get creative, have fun with it. And as always, keep pushing. You're almost at the end of this class, right? I'm looking forward to reading some of your thoughts on Yellow Dig. And if you need any clarity, contact myself or my TAs as always, as we are here to help you in all things. And I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. I will see you when you watch it. Bye.